morning, Kingsway. Good morning. Wow, there's energy here. I love when I get a good response when I hear all your voices saying a collective good morning. Hey, you heard Pastor Alina already mention it, but something odd took place this morning where we walked outside and we felt heat. Okay, now listen, for my winter fans in the place today, if you know me, you know I love winter. You know snow is like my best friend. If you're like me, today we're in a time of mourning because we understand that in just a few weeks, winter is ending. May listen, we're in Jersey. We know it might just have a random snow squall any day overnight before March 19th. But nonetheless, it's good to see you guys all here in the house. I wanna show some love to our Glassboro family down at the wings and our online family. Come on, Cherry Hill, let's show some love. So good to see you guys. Thank you for taking time out of your weekend to be here with us in church. Hey, it's gonna be a great day. We, I believe that with all my heart. If you don't know who I am, my name is Dave and I have the honor of serving as the youth director here at Kingsway Church. And I don't have the opportunity and the privilege to speak on Sundays often, but Fridays keep me pretty busy. I have the honor of speaking to the lives of students every Friday night. And before we dive in to our text and our theme of today, I just wanna allow you to peek into what's been happening happening at Revo over the last month because God has been meeting our students in a supernatural way. Come on, we can show some love and gratitude for God for that. All glory to the Lord. Listen, over the last couple of weeks, we had about 14 to 15 students, some planned, some not planned, just on the spot, come up here on a Friday and, you know, took the microphone on stage and just proclaimed what God is doing in their lives, how Jesus is transforming their hearts, and we saw them preach messages to their peers. We had a powerful night of worship and prayer two weeks back where students just came forward and just laid things down at the feet of Jesus. I believe the Holy Spirit just revealed some things in students' lives. I believe God um, shown some light on some things that should not be there in students' hearts. And students have been laying those things down. And at Revo, we have community. Of course, we want to have fun. There's food, there's snacks, but there's a real relationship, church. We have an amazing youth team that pours into our students almost every Friday during the school year. And I also want to encourage the parents, whether you're in the room at Glassboro watching us online, that if you have a student that is between the ages of 6th and 12th grade, we want them to be here on a Friday night, amen. Get your students here, come on, you get the model at, you can influence that. Get your students here at Revo on Fridays. And while you're clapping, I thought I'll be fitting just real quick for a short moment, I just want to show some honor and love to our Revo youth team. For all of those that serve on Fridays, come on Cherry Hill, can we do this together? Just appreciate our Revo team. You guys make it happen. You guys are a blessing. Listen, me and Fran, we cannot do what we do without our team. And I mean that. Our team is a blessing, and Revo is rocking for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Well, hey, over the last couple weeks, if you've been here, if you've been watching us online, you have heard Pastor Phil share a series that we've titled Take Hold. And we believe that this series was the vision for where God is taking Kingsway Church in 2024 and how God is calling all of us to be a part of that. And that main concept was this, that we want to be disciples in Christ that are growing deeper in maturity and are reaching our influence further. And in order for all of us to truly grasp this and understand what this means, we have to know that we can't just sit on these things. We have to be actively living these things out. And for that to work, guess what? It takes all of you. It doesn't just fall on pastors and our leaders and our ministry leaders here, but it takes all of us collectively. And I want someone to know today that if you've been sitting here for a while and you're not sure the part that you play, God can help you figure that out. We believe that he will. But I I want you to know that you have a part to play in this vision for Kingsway Church. We believe that all of us are to grow deeper in maturity and to extend our reach further. And if God is speaking it, and if God is breathing it, then it falls on us to steward it, amen? So today, for the next 25 minutes that we have together, I wanna to kind of lead us in a discussion and talk about the part that we play in responsible influence. Everyone here say influence. Come on, glass, bro. Say it again. Say influence. We all have a part to play because every follower of Christ is called to be an influence. 
And if we just took a moment to pause and reflect, and if we began thinking about every person we've come into contact with in February alone, last month, you may realize that depending on work, depending on relationships, life groups, being here in the house, whatever it may be, you might understand that we see a lot of people and interact with a lot of voices throughout our days. And we can call that for the sake of today, we're gonna call those people our circle of influence. This term actually was released and discussed in 1940s when a psychologist named Kurt Lewin began to share off of studies that people are influenced in different ways, but the most important influence is people's voices, whether it's family, friends, colleagues, social networks, whatever it may be, he's realized off of many studies that people's behavioral change becomes permanent the more people they are around. So who people are around what they do, the voices they're listening to, what they're sharing, that has shaped permanent behavioral change. And you guys probably know this, right? But in these circles of influence, one of two things tend to happen. One, our influence rubs off on others. Or two, others' influence rubs off on us. And this might not always be intentional, but it does happen sometimes unwillingly or by accident. Let me give you a quick few examples. Any sports fans in the house today, right? I love sports, love the game, football, hockey, basketball, baseball, you name it. I just love sports. If you would ask my wife, who doesn't have much care nor love for the game that I do, she might not ever match that same intensity, but for a guy that just rambles and talks about sports nonstop, she has now learned some rules of football and hockey and basketball because I'm just talking about it openly as if she cares to even listen to me, but just by being around me, she has learned some of the rules of the game, right? How many of us have accents here? I was at a store last week and someone asked me, hey, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from Philly, but I moved to Jersey when I was four years old. And she said, oh, you have an accent. Do you know that? And I said, no, I never actually heard that before, ever. But all this to say, when we're around people that may have a different accent than us, sometimes we just adapt to it. Has it happened to anybody else in the house today, maybe at Glassboro? We adapt to their accents. We start laughing the same way. We start sharing certain mannerisms the more we're around specific people. How about when we're around people that kind of just stress us out? drain our energy, we tend to become a little bit more sensitive to negativity. And of course, if you're around people that just scream joy, they are a walking influence, they never had a bad day, they're always happy, you guessed it, but being around people like that might help us to make us more positive. And we see in the book of Proverbs that King Solomon addresses that influence matters. And he writes this in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Listen, church, I want us to get this today because influence is something that we all have. We might exercise it differently. We may use it in different ways. It might look different than how we're used to it, but we all exercise our influence daily. It might be how we worship. It might be how we respond to certain things and world events. It might be how we walk in the church ready for a good day. If you serve our guest experience teams, hey, you play a huge part in making sure that a first-time guest has a great start to their experience here at Kingsway. Again, all this to say influence matters. And because a lot of this happens so naturally, when it comes to influence, we shouldn't have to always look for a platform to exercise it. But what we should do is stay aligned to this purpose. If we're looking for an opportunity, if we're looking for a platform or a stage or a pulpit, whatever it may be, we can exercise our influence in those ways. But come on, church, we don't have to use those things. We don't have to wait for those things. We can exercise our influence and our purpose and our God-given purpose and our circles every single day. How many of us, by a show of hands, Glassboro, you as well, have you heard the term influencer before? Raise your hand. Almost every single hand is up here, probably in Glassboro as well. But influence, influencers have this rare draw to a crowd. For some reason, whether they're streaming on YouTube or some type of influential website or blog, whatever it is, they're doing something right. 
okay? And if you're like me and you kind of like can't stand social media and you get more like eye rolls on social media than encouragement, that's how I feel. But again, we can't deny that they're doing something right because people keep on coming back, they keep on adding subscribers and they're growing their influence. I asked somebody last week why they think these influencers keep on gathering these crowds and this momentum of people viewing and subscribing. And this person said this. It's actually quite funny. She said, I think people realize that others' lives may be more exciting than ours. So we tend to tune in. We get a little bit curious. We see basically what is going on. So today, I want to allow us to reclaim that word influencer. I want us to examine and to acknowledge our God-given purpose and our God-given influence. Because it's more than just the person sharing it, right? But what also matters is what's being said. What's the message? What is the point coming across? Who do we represent? And I couldn't possibly talk about this concept of influence and life change and us being disciples that reach further without mentioning the impact that Paul has had on the churches in the New Testament. Paul was a missionary. He has written over 70% of the New Testament. He has mentored people like Timothy and Titus, and he has relationship and mentorships with people like Barnabas. And Paul lived his life on a mission. And I want to kind of, over the next 20 minutes today, I want to talk about three ways that we as a church, in your circles of influence, no matter where you are, how we can steward responsible influence. Sound good? You guys awake today? Just me? We ready? All right, awesome. Here you go. Point number one is this. We have to know that influence is not always instant. Our culture would reject this claim and rebuke this claim because our society is in a results now culture. We want to see the results right away. We want to see the finished product. We don't care much about the process much or what people are sitting with, but we want to know what's taking place and what the end result is immediately. We want things when we want it and we want them right now. We want them fast, right? Of course, it's easier to go through a drive through than it is to prepare a dinner for a family. Of course, it's easier to get in the car and just roll down your window, place an order, and be done in five or six minutes. Of course, it's easier to subscribe to Amazon Prime when we're paying $15 extra a month as opposed to waiting just the two to three extra shipping days. We want things fast, and we want them when we want it. But we can't assume, church, that influence works this way. Because oftentimes we don't see the fruit right away. Oftentimes we won't see the impact right away. Parents in the room here are Glassboro, you know this well, right? If you are a parent, you most likely know that the principle of your impact, you're not gonna see it in the same day, right? It may take a while. And in most cases, you're gonna see the fruit of your teaching, of your parenting, of your leadership. It might be months or years down the road but it does not mean that it's not there. It does not mean that God is not using it to work on your children's hearts. It does not mean that it's just dead and it's buried. Listen, maybe it's growing. Maybe it's budding. Maybe something is being built. But if something is taking time to develop, that means that's not complete yet. And if something isn't complete yet, and we are waiting for it to be finished, what that tells me, church, is that we have to wait and we have to guard our influence while God still entrusts it to us, amen? We have to guard it, we have to make sure it stays healthy, and we have to make sure it stays aligned in our purpose. In the book of Galatians, we see Paul who is addressing several churches in the southern Galatia region. And many believe this to be a region where Paul and Barnabas found on their one of their early missionary journeys together. And what's taking place here is there is a number of Jewish Christians that began to exchange the truth, freedom found in Christ, and they exchanged it for a lie. They began to believe that it had to be by their works or by following the law of Moses obediently, and that's all they had to do without real relationship and without real freedom found in Christ. So Paul gets a little bit upset and he's a little bit concerned because he's hearing about these things. He's hearing the false teaching taking place and he writes this letter to the Galatian church and he addresses them and he says this in Galatians chapter five, verse seven. 
He says, you are running the race so well. You are doing great. You are running well. You are with Jesus. You are with the Holy Spirit. You are running so well. And then he says this, who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. The false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. See, the Galatian church heard the good news about Jesus. Paul was with them. Paul influenced them to believe the truth that freedom and real freedom was found in Christ. But they began to believe that by works, not by faith, but by works, they could be considered children of God. So they stumbled. They became influenced. They've seen it. They've experienced Christ. But now down the road, they became influenced in the wrong direction. And Paul's writing saying, what happened? Paul is asking, what is going on? Who made you stumble? And Paul sees this unhealthy spread of influence and he relates it to an illustration of bread dough to get his point across. That in the same way, a little healthy yeast causes bread to rise. Where's my sourdough family at? Come on, I know, I know you're out there. I know you're out there. I've seen it on TikTok, Instagram. Come on, I've seen it on social media. But dough rises when healthy yeast is added. But in rotten yeast or dead yeast is added, the bread stays the same and it causes contamination. And Paul is saying in this letter that in the same way, this false teaching that is spreading far from the truth is contaminating the church. And then he adds later that we have to use the freedom that we have in Christ to serve one another in love. I once sat in a leadership conference my last year of college and the guest speaker, he wasn't a pastor, he wasn't a minister, he was just a very successful, healthy, 40 plus year businessman. And he said this when it came, when it came to influence. He asked the question, and the question was this, when you enter a room, does the mood rise or does it fall? Let that sink in for just a few moments today, Kingsway. When you enter a room, does the mood rise or does it fall? That's always stuck with me. Because am I perfect? Of course not. Do I probably bug some people? Of course. Do I tend to mess up and not be on my best behavior or best influence? Sure, that may happen. But do I wanna resemble salt and light the way Jesus tells us to in Matthew chapter five? Absolutely, absolutely. Because salt adds flavor, salt preserves, salt adds things, it protects food over time. And of course, light, we are to shine our light before others in the same way that Christ came to be a light for the world. And this is important, this question, because we have to know that there will always be competing voices against our own influence. So when you walk into work tomorrow morning, when you walk into a conversation after church today, the question remains, does the mood rise or does it fall? Paul writes this in Galatians chapter six. He says, you will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own simple nature will harvest decay and death from that simple nature. But those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit. Kings, why I want us to be a church that stays on course. I want us to be a church that knows what it means to call each other disciples of Christ to stay aligned to mission, to know that influence may not be instant, but God is working through it, amen? And for that to work, it takes time. You heard us talk about bread earlier. Making bread takes time. It's not instant. It takes preparing, it takes feeding the dough, it takes all these processes before that. And watch what Paul says in the next couple of verses in verse nine through 10. He says, let's not get tired of doing what is good. Because at just the right time, this was our theme verse of our Revo Youth team a couple years ago. We focused on it. We kept it in front of our team members. I prayed about this. But here it is. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Do you believe that harvest is coming today? Because I do. And we have to stay the course, not give up. And Paul says this, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Listen, I've always been a firm believer that sometimes the best message that we preach might not be from a pulpit or from a Bible, but it's how we live and how we treat other people. 
So if influence isn't always instant and God is doing the work and we have a part to play, we have to know to not give up and when we have the opportunity, let's continue to be good and do good to everyone, amen? Point number two regarding responsible influence is this. Influence has an echo. If something has an echo, it's probably pretty loud. If a tree falls in the forest, is anybody around to hear it? I'm not asking that question today. But if something crashes, if it's a truck on the interstate, whatever it may be, if something happens and it creates an echo, there is a noise that travels. There is a quote in the movie Gladiator in prime time, Russell Crowe, and Russell Crowe says this before at one of the major battles early in the film. He tells his men, he says, what we do in life echoes in eternity. Reality is, church, someday all of us, including all of this, will eventually pass away, burn, and die. I know it's not very encouraging, but it's true, right? We will at some point all leave this earth until God calls us home, right? But we're not supposed to be here forever. And eventually what's left of us will be a couple of things, right? Our reputation, our influence, our legacy, and I don't want people to look at my life and say, yeah, he just did things his way. He just tried, you know, he made it every single day, day by day, it was a struggle. But I want people to look at me and to know that I did my best to reflect Christ every single day. Again, am I perfect? Absolutely not. But responsible influence has an echo. There was um, a couple people in my life where I've seen this practice applied and I was influenced by them. I had a teacher whose name was Mr. Cannon, and we, I used to be in this kids, you know, guys only kids group called Awana. Maybe some of you guys know what Awana is, maybe down in Glassboro. But Awana stood for approved workmen are not ashamed. And that derived from 2 Timothy chapter 2, when Paul is writing to Timothy. I'll never forget the impact that Mr. Cannon had on me, because every single Wednesday night when we gathered, he'd make it a point to not just shake my hand, but to ask me about my week to ask me how my faith, to ask me how my Bible reading is going. And if I'm being honest, he would hound me and I kind of needed it, all right? Because I'm a, you know, young guy kind of figuring out who Jesus is, what's church about, what's his community. And every time I went, me and my brother, he would ask us piercing questions. And at that time, it was more of like, oh, here comes Mr. Cannon. We got to run away. He's going to hound us again. But what I didn't realize over time is that he was investing in my life. And on Sundays when we go as a family, literally, I'm not kidding here, me and my brother would be in service and we'd see Mr. Cannon all across the room. He'd do one of these things. And we'd be like, oh no. And I used to, I'm telling you, I used to run to the bathroom trying to avoid this man. And good old Mr. Cannon, God bless him. I wash my hands, walk out that door. Guess who's sitting right there waiting for me? Mr. Cannon, he was not ashamed, he was not embarrassed, his life was on mission. He saw something in me and he knew that he had to model influence. And I don't think Mr. Cannon ever knew, but by him checking in on me, by him acknowledging me as a young man, this man was in his upper 50s, probably early 60s, but he didn't realize he was changing my life in the way that he was. But it's only years down the road, again, there's the echo effect, right? Years down the road, I see that Mr. Cannon has blessed me Tremendously, I would call Mr. Cannon an influencer. How about some of our teachers, right? I've been blessed to know and spend time with several of my high school teachers, both in school and also after school, just catching up, connecting, hearing about how their life is going, how their kids are doing, right? All these things. But there was a time in my life where I couldn't speak like this. There was a time in my life where I wasn't so confident. There is a time where I would shake and I'd be terrified of public speaking and I'd be nervous and I'd start to stutter and I'd spit. And it was kind of like a mess, to be honest. It was a big deal, all right? It wasn't pretty. But thank God I had teachers in my life to sit with me, to realize where I was. They didn't just pass me off. They sat with me in my struggle and they helped shape who I am today. I'm blessed to know teachers like that. I would call those teachers of mine influencers. And how I first came to be plugged in the youth group, the story is pretty funny and pretty sad on my part, to be honest. But when I first came to youth group, you know, outside of Awana, obviously growing older, being around eighth grade or so now, my mom asked me a question. She said, hey, do you want to go to the store with me? I said, sure, I'd love to. Because I like going shopping with my parents, shop right, Kohl's, whatever it is. And we get in the car, and I noticed that when she's driving, she passed the exit for the shopping market. And I said, mom, this, this isn't the way we go to Kohl's. And she's like, yeah, I know, I know. 
And I'm like, where are we going? And she's like, you'll see. And she pulls up the church. And I'm like, oh, what's going on? Now, I wasn't against church. I wasn't afraid of church. It just wasn't my thing at that point. And my mom opens the door. She presses the automatic button. The door in the van opens. She goes, all right, get out. And I said, no, do I have to? She's like, oh, yes, get out. And I began like clawing, like, no, I don't want to go. I don't know anybody. And she's like, if you don't get outside this door, I'm going to drag you in and make a big scene for everyone else. How's that sound? And I said, okay, I'll go. I'll go, all right? And the same way, parents, get your kids to Revo. Here's my plug, right? Just saying, just saying. <laughs> but I walk into that youth group and I see a small circle of people, three or four students, four youth leaders. One of those people was our lead pastor, Pastor Phil. For those that didn't know, he was my youth pastor growing up. And if my mom didn't drive me and force me to go to church, I might not have ever met Pastor Phil and the influence he's had on my life. And of course, as he pastored me, mentored me, the relationship that we have, he's done a phenomenal job at pouring into me, showing me what a man of God is to look like, how a man of God is to be. And of course, years and years fast forward, and I get to serve under his influence and under his leadership here at Kingsway Church. Don't ever tell me influence doesn't have an echo. You can't. Influence has an echo. And we may not see it in the moment, but when we look back years from now, we can pinpoint and realize the work that God was doing. Even against our sinful nature, even against our selfish flesh, God is working, amen? And because I met Pastor Phil, because I was pouring into as a student, because he trained me up in several ways to know what it means to be a youth leader, to live my life on mission, it was years after I met him where I first felt God call me to youth ministry. And now here at Kingsway, it'll be five years in June that I've been here as Revo's youth director. And I can look back and thank the people in my life, Mr. Cannon, my teachers, Pastor Phil, our coworkers today, my friends today. People have influence. Paul says this to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, you have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Paul was so convinced, not because he's heard about it, because he's lived it, because he's seen it. He was convinced that his influence in Timothy's life and in Timothy's life and in his influence on others were to be generational and they would continue through the generations. And he knew that Timothy needs some encouragement. He wrote him this letter to tell him to keep pressing on and to keep preaching the faith. Listen, if we all took a moment today and thought back to who got us here, not physically like here in your seat or watching us online or in Glassboro, but who got us to this stage of life? Who got us to be here right where we're at today? If we took a moment and looked back, we could realize that somebody or something helped pave the way to get us here. And if I can be honest with you for a second, I think it'll do us a lot of good that maybe at some point this week, when you thought of those people or those things, Shoot them a quick text message. Give them a phone call. Just say, hey, listen, I know this is random. Hope your life is doing well. It's been a while. But I just wanted to thank you for the impact you've had on my life. Listen, can I be honest again? Sometimes you showing gratitude for people's influence will help them realize theirs. So give them a text. Shoot them a phone call. Encourage them. Because again, influence echoes. Amen? And the last thing regarding responsible influence, point number three, is this. Responsible influence brings people to Jesus. I don't want my life to ever resemble a way where it's all about me. I don't want people to follow me because I will disappoint them. I'm human. I don't want our students to ever follow me and Fran and Revo and just assume that because we're in leadership, they should follow us. No, no, no. My goal is, hey, if you want to follow me, okay, do so, but follow me as I follow Christ. Follow Jesus, see the faithfulness of God, not in me, but in who Christ is. Listen, I might get some eye rolls for our students in the room, but when it comes to influencers, if I can just say this, Jesus was the best influencer of all time. He was. He didn't ask for crowds. Crowds gathered to see him. He didn't demand a large gathering. People wanted to hear his message. People wanted to understand their role in the body of Christ. He grew his following faster than any social media influencer, any online influencer, whatever it is. He grew quite the following. And he invited people and engaged others to live like children of God. And he invited them to the invitation of a new life. To go 
and to sin no more. We see in scripture that we see Paul himself was changed by an encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. And we see the influence that had as people walked away from that. Like, is this the same Paul, the same Saul that was killing all these Christians and doing all these things? But Paul's life was radically changed and he became an influence. Again, writing more than 70% of the New Testament. Paul began to write these letters and to encourage others to not live and not to preach our word from our flesh, but to preach Christ in all things, amen? So church, I wanna tell you today, if God has been good to you, let somebody know. If God has been faithful to you, let somebody know. If he has changed your life, if he has influenced you, if he is still working, let somebody know. Because you would be surprised how many people in the world are looking desperately for just a chance or an opportunity to hear about Jesus. And you heard me say earlier that we all come, come together and play a part in this in growing deeper in maturity and reaching beyond our grasp, reaching further. Here's where you come in. Because it might be a lot for people to come and sit in a building on a Sunday. But we are to be the church out in the world, amen? And what would happen if we shared our stories, if we shared the fruit, if we shared who Jesus is and what he's doing in our lives, people's lives can be changed. Influence brings people back to Jesus. Paul's life was transformed in his conversion. We see the widow were in Samaria. She went to the town and told everyone, hey, come see a man who knew everything about me. Could this man be the Messiah? We see the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. He left and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And in this reason, we see Peter right in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says, as a result, you can show the others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I don't think you need me to tell you this this morning, but lately, over the last several years, our world is, seems to be growing dark. But I'm thankful for the bride of Christ, for the church, because in darkness, the church shines. In darkness, we can share our light. We can be salt and light in the world. We have a voice, and your voice matters, church. You hear me, Glassboro? Your voice matters. If you're pouring into our kids or students or adults, your voice matters. You all have a part to play. And listen, here's the reality. If we don't use our voice for the kingdom, the world will have no problem substituting our voice of truth for theirs. And I don't wanna be like the church in Galatia when they heard the truth and they've been with Christ and they encountered the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden some false teaching that spread contaminated their thoughts. I wanna live my life on mission. And I think we can all strive to live how Paul encourages the church of Ephesus. He says this in Ephesians chapter five, verse 15. He says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Now watch this. He says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Church, I think God gives us with moments. I think God gives us opportunities to impact others. I know this isn't anything crazy deep, but it's very really practical. But listen, what would happen if we all left this place and knew the influence that we had from the Lord and we used it responsibly? Again, just think of those circles of influence that you see every single week in your job, at home, to your kids, wherever it may be. We have a part to play. Encountering Jesus changes things. When we sit with Jesus, we leave that place changed. We leave transformed. When we know Christ, understand the transformative work that he has in us, it changes us. One of my favorite things that I get to do is see that fruit in students, where students go from one side or one point to the other. And again, I wish that every student that came to Reva on a Friday night, I wish they would just experience Christ, experience the Holy Spirit's power, and leave this place on fire and change. But again, we know it doesn't always happen that way. But God is building something at Kingsway. I want you to know that today. God is building something here. It takes all of us. It takes all of you. I don't have this on the screen, but Philippians chapter four, verse eight, Paul says, and now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. 
Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. And don't just think about these things, church. Don't just think about these things. We gotta do it. We have to put them into practice. Everyone has closed their eyes all around this place. We're gonna close. I wanna pray for you, pray over your life. I want you to understand the role of influence that you have in your circles, in your jobs, in your friend groups. And maybe you're sitting here today and you say, you know what, Dave, I, I don't really understand what my influence is. I don't really understand the role I play. Well, I just wanna encourage you, next time we had a growth track, get plugged in. You can develop and discover your God-given purpose where you can make a difference and impact the lives of others. If you're sitting here today thinking about, well, I don't, God doesn't want me that much and I don't understand what part I can play. If you knew my past, Steve, if you knew my story, you would know my influence has diminished, the candlelight is out. I just wanna encourage you. I wanna encourage you for a moment. The enemy wants you to think and believe the lies that you can't be used by God. The enemy wants you to believe that what you have is not able to bless others. I wanna tell you today and stand in the promise that through Christ, all things are possible and through the transformative work of the Holy Spirit, God wants to use the enemy plan for evil and use it for good. And I believe that for all of us today. So close your eyes, bow your heads. Let me just pray for you before I hand it off to Pastor Alina in a moment. Father, we thank you that you trust us, Lord, with our voice. God, we thank you that you give us gifts to be used to edify the church, to encourage others, to live our lives on mission, and to live our lives on purpose. And God, for us to be a church that grows deeper in maturity and extends our reach further, we have to understand that we all have a part to play. And I pray that over my friends, over my brothers and sisters today, Lord God, that they've been sitting on their hands for a while, they've just come to attend church, to sit in a seat every Sunday. Lord, remind them that through you, that through your power of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, you can transform them, you can use them, their voice matters, the way they live, the fruit of their life can inspire countless others. Father, we give you this time together. And God, I believe that we can be a church that knows what it means to go out into the world and to bless others, not by just preaching the word, because that's, that's important, but by modeling how we live, by modeling who we represent and knowing that influence comes at a cost. And it's gonna take sacrifice. But God, we know that responsible influence should always point people back to you, Jesus. We ask all these things in Jesus' name.